I had the greatest job in the world, and that's working with dogs. Best in show winner is the French Bulldog. Winston won the National Dog Show. It was amazing, it was exciting. And to have a dog to be number one dog in this country, you have to have great nutrition. And I always fed Pro Plan, just like us. When we eat well, we feel good. And I just love that food and what it's done all these years to all the dogs I've bred and all the dogs I've shown. Welcome to Pure Dog Talk. I am your host, Laura Reeves, and I've got a really fun guest for us today, you guys. And I mean fun in every sense of the word. <laughs> Christian Rutten is a, a young owner handler, breeder owner handler, handler handler that I have known since I can remember. And I just, I'm really interested to hear what he has to say. He, he came to me and said, I want to talk about this thing. And I think it's really important. And I said, Christian, if you think it's important, I think it's worth talking about. So we're going to talk about how people get started, how new people get started, and and how to grow that. And and Christian has a pretty good story to tell us about that. So welcome, Christian. Yep. Good morning. Afternoon. Yes. Good, eh, good day. <laughs> good day. <laughs> good day. If it's uh, in Australia, right? Exactly. All right. So Christian, give us the 411. Give us, you know, sort of the brief history. <laughs> All right. And Not I'll the keep long it brief version history. I'll keep it brief because I have a lot of stuff that I think I would like to cover. But All right. my cat has joined us in the background okay. here. Cats can come on dog podcast. <laughs> it's totally fine. It's a pretty uh, kitty. She, I had the door shut and she's meowing. It's like, all right, we got to leave it cracked for you. But anyway, um, 411. I actually started in Dog 4-H, which if you have like young kids and you want to get started, that there's no better way, right? It kind of yep. gets the ball rolling. You have to do your record books. You're teaching obedience, rally, agility. You're doing your judging exam. So you're having to talk about why you're placing certain classes, whether that's for handling or confirmation. Then you've got to do your public presentation. So talk and, and, and know how to talk, which is ironic because I was a very shy kid. I mean, yep. I, my dad had this friend, I remember one time, all he did was looked at me and I peed my pants. So, I mean, that still happens sometimes, but I'm just kidding. Uh, so, anyway, so I started with a 17 year old toothless and deaf Pomeranian. And of all the people in the world who had had a litter of golden puppies, I tried a boxer and I tried other things, um, was Joe Simpson. So for those of you who don't know, Carly Simpson who uh, and Cameron, who did dog it, uh, their mother's Joe Simpson, and she was our 4-H leader. And so Joe had this golden puppy and a Chesapeake Bay Retriever. So we had this thing called the dog caper. She says, let's go to the dog caper. You can show the Chessie and play with the golden puppy. Well, the Chessie peed on my leg. It dragged me down and there was nothing better. I loved every minute of it. The golden uh, was a puppy I never saw because everybody was always cuddling with this cute golden puppy. So about a month goes by and she offered us to buy him. That was my first show dog if you will he never finished i showed him in confirmation a couple times um and then i started in juniors uh from juniors i went as an assistant worked as a you know assistant to shane tiffany skinner for nearly 10 years uh, later on as i got to the end of high school i uh, started doing more ffa agricultural things because of which i still wanted to attend the major golden specialties the national and this that and the other so at that point, I went to a, some of the bigger shows with Tanya Struble, where we were doing, you know, 15, 20 Goldens, and we were just focusing on one individual breed, you know, no Schnauzers, Porties, Britneys, you know, everything I could live without today, sadly. Uh, it's just too, it's like, you know, when you eat too much ice cream, eventually you can never have that flavor again. That's how it is for washing Porty legs and washing Schnauzer legs. So anyway, I'm not going to drone on here. I have a lot to cover, but... Um, <laughs> Chop, chop, Christian. <laughs> From Tanya, um, I got what became my foundation, Bitch and Breeding. In 2000, and I'm not sure of the year, we opened our all breed handlings with myself and my fiance. Um, and so I tried to check all the boxes, which was I was an owner handler. I started when I was young, I didn't have parents involved in dogs. I'm now a breeder. As soon as we get done here, I have to go get a dog collected and I got to get them shipped. I've got a puppy that's going home this evening. Megan's down at show showing. So I, I'd like to say that I have a very broad perspective of every aspect of the sport, which is 
a good perspective to have for people who say, you know, it's all rigged or you got to have the best dog to win or you got to have the best dog to create a really good one. So that's kind of where I'm at today. So, well, and Christian, you're young. You're just what, 30 yeah. 27. My birthday's uh, next month. I, I knew I'd known you like since you were born yeah. practically. Actually, maybe I'm 26. I got to remember the dates <laughs> here, but I, you know, 56, 56 one or the other, whatever. Right. It's one of those. Um, so Christian, I, I think that what you provide is a well-rounded experience for sure. And, right. and one of the things that I think I hear every single day, literally every day, there's someone in my patrons group or someone on social media or someone somewhere that says, I need a mentor. How do I find a mentor? I right. can't find a mentor. Nobody will mentor me. My mentor's mean to me. Right. Talk to us so, about mentorship. All right. So here's the thing. I think that a lot of your, your podcasts are very educational, but most of the time when you roll into your 411, it's well in, in 1940 or 1950 or 1960, I went into the newspaper and I found an ad. And in the ad, there was a dog. I got the dog from a breeder. I went to a match. At the match, the dog won. And then I was hooked for life. <laughs> That's pretty much how they all go, but that's not what it's like. Occasionally, today. sometimes they take a deviation and they start right. in obedience. Those are the, right. those are the two. Well, that's true. And with German shepherds yep. or, you know, right. so anyway, uh, but it's a different game today. So today it's a lot of social media. A lot of people are advertising, you know, their dog is the greatest or their dog is, you know, this or that, or I'm seeking a performance home. Well, not every dog has to go be exhibited. Now, are there performance homes? Absolutely. But I think you're going to find way more companion homes than anything else. So I think if you're starting out and, and whether you've been in dogs for 10 years or you just started and you're saying, you know what, I'm not to the point of where I want to be and I'm not sure what the connection between A and B is. How do I get there? So I would say reverse and roll back and, and try to, if you're going to plan a family vacation, go to the big, go to Orlando and just go to the dog show for one day. You know, go to New York and go to the dog show for one day. Figure out what the biggest show in your area is and just go for a day. Consistency and time. Watch your breed. You know, who is being the most successful? And as, as much as I hate to say it, some people who are the most successful in the moment shouldn't be. But the reason they are is because they had great ones before. And that's how they got known, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just the name of the game. It's not... It's... It's not that people are crooked, right? It's that they're there to reward the best dog, but especially in a breed like Golden's where people get overwhelmed by the quantity, the difference of styles and appearances. A lot of times it's like facial recognition. Well, I've seen this one with a great dog, right? So look for the people who are being rewarded on a regular basis and go talk to them. Some people aren't super receptive in the moment, but find them later, right? And I think the biggest mistake people make is they cut corners. They find the people who are sitting and, and just have a lot of downtime because they're easy to talk to. But what you need to do is go to the top, right? The conversation at the top is different. Everybody's collaborating. Who can do this for what and what reason? The conversation at the bottom is usually, it's crooked, this, you know, oh, my dog is perfect and that one isn't. Okay, Christian, um, I want you to drill down on this because right. this, I think, this is one of the key most key elements right. is this, right. is that if you are surrounded by people who are mad because they lost, right. who can't see why they lost, who can't tell right. you why they lost, can't tell you why the other dog won, they're going to blame right. it on the judge because they don't have any um, um, parameters. They don't have any basis. Right. They don't have any, any skill set, right? Right. And they don't have a... at that level you're not making progress right and the breeder's job when they're selling you this puppy and you're and you're just getting started is they obviously are hopeful because they wouldn't sell you the puppy if they were right. i saw something the other day online that said oh breeders should only sell you know people who want to show their greatest dogs and how dare they not sell them anything else well but you don't always know what the end result's going to be so you can't go and say well these people didn't want to have the best for this individual right but what i want to say is that you know, if you're buying a dog, you need to be self-reflective about what is this dog's strength and weaknesses. And not only, and you know what, I, I hate, if you go ask a judge, right, you lost and, and you aren't sure why. And you go ask the judge and the judge says, well, he didn't ask for it on the day or he showed, I've seen, the other dog showed better or, you know, he, I just didn't like his, his, you know, whatever it is. Dog. I just discard that, right. When they say, you know, I wish your dog had a little better shoulder, a little bit shorter back, he could use a little bit stronger muzzle, 
and gets into the finite details, those are the people whose words you hang on, and from there you move forward. So look for the people who are extra critical first, not angry because they lost, but extra critical. And I think if you approach any judge from a standpoint of questioning, what was it that you liked about my dog or the other dog better than my dog today? They'll be honest with you. You have a lot of negative, and then the breeders say, well, the dog's perfect, so you shouldn't have lost. That judge is idiot, and they cross him off. Which gets me into another kind of sidebar thing real quick. I get so tired of day in and day out, the dog show judges report card. People saying, well, what's your opinion of this judge? I got to tell everybody, you need to make an opinion for yourself first. I know people don't have countless money to go spend, but every dog can be a different style and still represent the breed. And there are judges who are totally dismissive to owner handlers or totally pro handler. That's a thing, right? I'm young. I, I just started. It is, right? It, you could say from a, a degree scale, it's less than people would assume. Yes. But you need to go for yourself and enter under these people. And you can make your own do not show list if you want to. But I think the worst thing people can do is post on a public forum and get feedback. I see questions about judges who, sadly, I wouldn't walk across the street to evaluate my litter of puppies. And they're the greatest ones there's ever been. And then you see comments about people who are judging every finite detail of your exhibit. And they go, oh, they're just political, don't walk in their ring. So I think everybody needs to take their dog, be critical, and, and then from that, Make right. your own make your own list, your own assessments, right? But let's let's like you mentioned earlier, let's roll back just a minute, Christian. Right. In order for people to do that, they have to read the breed standard. They right. have to understand the what the breed standard and how it applies. Right. And they have to then actually apply it to their dog. Right. And, okay, and so, I would So walk me through how do these people get there? How do they right. get, read the breed standard, understand how it applies to the breed, apply it to my dog? Those Perfect. are three imperative steps that are unfortunately not as carefully um, <clears throat> attenuated as they might be. Right. So I think, again, the first thing is, is just to say, you know, blame the outside source on why your dog's not winning. I would say that the most successful breeders of any breed are way more critical on their own dogs than there are of anybody else's. When they, when they say this dog is, you know, my dog is the greatest that's ever been, and the other one only wins because of who shows it, that's problematic. But if you can say, my dog has a short back for my breed, right? He's got a short back. He's got a beautiful face. He carries a solid back in motion with minimal wasted action, balanced reach and drive. And the other dog possess none of that and beat me. That's fine, right? You can say that, but you cannot just say, you know, just throwing out that it's all faces. So where do you start on ground zero? First thing, anybody who, whether you've done dogs for 20 years or you're just starting, go to YouTube and look at dog steps, right? It's x-ray, breed specific. It's not breed specific, right? It's just about basic anatomy and how they work in motion. Okay, If you don't have that finite detail, and sometimes they'll show x-rays of a of maybe a shoulder, right? And they'll say, here you can see it in motion. And the dog is walking, and it doesn't necessarily represent what that x-ray just showed, but overall, it's a very good thing. So yeah. go watch your dog steps. The other thing is attend the largest specialties and the nationals that you can and see a broad array of... of With your standard in your lap. Right, right. And just be cognizant of what it is. If your breed has an illustrated standard, keep that, right? Uh, the golden retrievers were very lucky we have a blue book and we have dog steps which was done by a golden breeder mm -hmm. and i still to this day go back and read it you know i could almost verbatim read you the golden standard from memory i still read it and i still find things and go gosh i didn't realize it was worded in that order so anyway roll back roll back a little bit because i'm getting ahead of myself so what do you do to go from ground zero and work your way up so my suggestion is you go and you seek out those breeders that are just kind of next level, right? Or even handlers and who breeds your dogs, right? And then have a conversation with those breeders. Are they saying what individual pieces are what perpetuating them forward? Or are they just saying kind of blah terms, right? Mm -hmm. I think here's the thing. It is just as easy to breed a best in show winner in three generations from a, from a subpar animal as it is from a best in show animal. When you have a subpar animal and you're able to evaluate what's wrong with it in the second generation you try to fix it and then in the third generation you try to re retain type 
from that second step. Bless you. Pardon Bless me. you again. Oh God, I was I worried I was going to like, Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> when you have a best in show winner and you're trying to breed more generations of them, oftentimes what creates a really good dog are exemplary features in every aspect. The problem is any more than that feature and you're overdone, right? right? You have too much bend and stifle. You have too much forephase. You have too much size, too much coat, too much bone, right? Mm -hmm. In any way, if you go too much, you're over the top. So every decision you need to make, and I think that people need to, when you're looking for a dog, A, I want you to seek out the best breeder there is. B, trust their judgment. But C, be happy if you don't have the best in show winner. Because when you get handed that best in show winner on a golden platter, you cannot figure out what it takes to make it. Right. Right. I think that's a, that's a really, really good observation and one that I um, have noticed over the years, right. the people who start with that, you know, their first, right. their first of whatever breed is the best they're right. ever going to get. Right. And they did, they didn't go through the process and I've right. watched it. I have absolutely watched it. Right. And, and they some... never, they never get back to what that first dog was. Right. That somebody and... else bred. Right. And sometimes in three generations, right, you have your first one and it's a really good one. You breed it in your second one. It's not as good as the first one, but you kind of can fall off of the high that you had on your first one. And you can still be successful. Finish it in a short amount of time so you never really know what the judges are thinking. You're in and you're out, right? But yeah. it's in that third generation when you lose all those features and then you go, well, you know what? The sport is crooked. I can't win anymore. I used to win all the time. And just sit back and evaluate your own dog harder than anybody could. Mm -hmm. And if somebody gives you a blanket statement like, well, they're too long for me. Well, where are they too long? Are they too long on the loin? Too long on the underline, right? What's making the length of the underline? Is it a lack of return of upper arm? You know, are they lacking dimension in the rear? And so you just need to be so extra critical and trust your breeder who's bred great ones to continue to do so and then get feedback. Have them look at your puppies and don't ever say, I know when they say, right. I like this. I know. Well, if you knew, you wouldn't be asking me. So let's just listen for a second. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So two things, two things. Sometimes, um, you know, I think you find yourself in a spot. You're young. You're 26. Right. You have acquired by dent of effort more knowledge than many people significantly older than you. Right. And so you speak from the place of, knowing some of these right. things and still having learned how to, because I know who brought you up, learned right. how to keep your mouth shut and right. just listen. And I right. think that that is a valuable skill set. And I also wanted to spin off of one of the other things that you just mentioned. More than one good dog. <laughs> right. When you look for a breeder, one good one right. does not a breeder make. Look right. for that, look for that history, right? right? Like if you really want to go and you want to be competitive in dog shows, you want to find a breeder that you can work with that will right. talk to you, who will help walk you through why they did what they did. They weren't right. just breeding ribbons to ribbons, right? Right. And I think that's what you see most of the time with a lot of breeds that as they increase in size, they decrease in quality. Why? Because you have more up and coming breeders who are just going off of, well, this dog won, so I need to breed it to my bitch, right? And as numbers increase, you always see that. People say, you're so lucky to breed Goldens. You've got such a large gene pool. Well, really not. A lot of the dogs go back to the same things. We have health issues that we have to be very cognizant of, right? I wrote a thing one time that says, um, sacrifices are made in the whelping box to preserve and protect individual pieces not to breed just for winners, right? And that's the thing. So talk to your breeder. Well, what's the, what are the health issues that you face and how are you kind of navigating that in your breeding program? The other thing is on a total different thing, we say you want to get mentors and that's true. And there's a fine line between discarding everybody's opinion to ask everyone and absorbing as much knowledge as you can. So for me, you know, I was able to work with Tanya, we, we had a large string of dogs, you know, they're very similar in make and shape and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, prominent features among them all, right? 
So I could go through and I would study and I would look through her photo books and I would see all these dogs and I memorized or I could tell you what their pedigree is and what features they had and, and how they could move from the picture, right? Whether it was beautifully fronted or whatever. On the contrary, I went to specialties in Michigan and later after the specialty, we were close to Connie Gerstner Miller's. Mm -hmm. So I went to her and I sat in her back bedroom and she said, all the photo books are there. And I went through every photo book she had and every dog that she had. Who's this one? What's its pedigree? Different style, different make and shape, very, right. very similar foundation, right? Just a different finish on the outside. Mm. And, and I think that people need to also be willing to accept lots of information from the people who are very successful and then make your own determination. I say when you are breeding towards your ideal, close your eyes and picture what you're breeding towards, right? And then however you want to create that, and every breeder has their own kind of method. Uh, some breeders say, well, you can only retain type if you line breed. And some breeders say, well, you have to outcross to remain healthy. And my thing is you can retain type uh, and outcross. The reason that breeding type to type, I mean, re breeding so closely uh, when you're line breeding gives you the similar type is because you're breeding like type because it's all the same dogs. If you outcross, you can successfully outcross. I I think of an accordion, right? You bring it in and then you come out. You bring it in and you come out, right? But when you are outcrossing or you're making different decisions, make sure you're seeking like type to your dog. If it's the type that you like, if not, then, oh, I love this sire. So I'm going to breed to him and then build off of that type and style. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, if you want to lock it in, look at the sire's mother and how similar is that to your bitch, mm -hmm. right? And so I think you need to create an ideal for yourself and that's how you move forward. Right. And that's on the breeding aspect for the people who are just showing their own dogs, then find a breeder who you think represents that ideal and bounce information off of them without saying, I know. Right. Can where do you think I could groom a little bit better? Well, you could maybe take this foot a little bit tighter. Well, I know. OK, then why didn't you do it? Right. So just <laughs> zip it and retain information. And if you want to ask somebody else, you can. Where it gets problematic is when you ask 15 people the same question. They all give you their, you know, there's 20 ways to get to the bus stop. Mm -hmm. But getting on the bus and going to your destination is on you, right? Mm -hmm. I just came up with that. That was pretty I good. I actually really like that. <laughs> that, is, that, that I'm going to keep that one, Christian. Because I, just, I just threw really that up good. on the wing. That, but, but anyway. I also think if you ask 15 people how to get to the bus stop, and you um, do one and then you do the other and then you do somebody else's and you never make it on the bus right? Be because right. you're too busy doing 15 different things. Right. And, and focus on your own ideal, right? For me and my breed, I think that there's very specific attributes that have to be preserved. In any breed, I hate to say, that type is movement. Without breed-specific movement, you don't have breed-specific type, right? And so for me, when I let my dogs out into the yard, I want to see them going easy with a good back, minimal wasted action. Once I have that foundation, I'll work off of the type and style, mm -hmm. right? Then you can push and pull and people say, well, those goldens look nothing alike. Well, if they were all the same shade of gold and then you gave them all correct coats, they would be very similar. Right. The problem is there's a huge contrast in shades of gold, but where you see these pieces fall apart is in motion. Right. So with any breed, you want your breed specific motion to be retained. I don't know where I was going with this, but <laughs> okay. Oh, so, so trying to gather information from lots of people. That's what it was. Right. The gathering information from lots of people and, and structure in motion is imperative. Right. Um, right. Another one that I love. Is oh, I remember. I remember what I was going to say. What I was going to say was that I work towards my own individual ideal and discard what not all the judges are saying, but discard like I don't breed for the ribbons. I don't breed to go win. I don't breed and say I'm breeding to create a best in show winner. But I'm creating to breed my ideal and the ribbons will follow, especially once you figure out which judges like your specific style. And if you're retaining type within each generation. It'll make it very easy for you. You know, somebody says, oh, that person only wins under that judge. Well, maybe they just like or they continually present dogs from the same breeder who that judge is very fond of that style.
Drew Panion is revolutionizing medical insurance for pets by providing the best possible experience to our members. And it's not some space age dream, it's happening now. We pay your veterinarian directly while you're checking out and we're the only ones who can, which means you have decisions in seconds and you don't have to wait for reimbursement. So unlike with other providers, you'll keep more money in your pocket. Ask your veterinarian if True Panion can pay them directly because there's pet insurance and then there's True Panion. Let's stop on that one too, because this is another educational piece that I think people could really take a lesson from you. I have talked to you, as I said, I've known you since you were a kid and I have talked to you consistently and you are one of the single best handler, owner, handler, you name it, in going and saying, this judge likes this, this judge likes this, this judge likes this. I know this because I have paid attention. Talk me through, talk our listeners through how you, I mean, okay, maybe you're like magic Sheldon gifted, but how do you, how do All right. you- Get so this is great. In. I like the I like this question a lot. So here's I just want to roll on to something when you said that. Right? People say for for the Golden Retriever Club of America, we have an issue right now where you have to if you're a professional handler, you have to be a sole owner to exhibit in sweepstakes. So like myself and my fiance who are not married, we have to be individual owners on these dogs to present in sweepstakes. And it and there's also two people who may be co-breed and have co-bred for 30 years who also show, and they have to have individual owners if you're a professional handler. So one of the things people said is, I just I just went to a dog show for, for 10 straight shows and I didn't get any ribbon. And, and that's all political and the handlers have the upper edge. And I did the math because I was at a big string of shows. And I had walked in the ring 28 times and won two majors. This gal didn't go into the ring 28 times in the year and she didn't win any majors, right? So we have the opportunity to present a lot more. So although As it looks like we're, we're right. receiving a lot more ribbons, well, we're also going to a lot more shows. But anyway, back to what the judges prefer. In any breed, judges are gonna have preferences and that's just the way it is. You can, when you go pull up your, here's how I do every program. My vet, who you know well, Anders, mm -hmm. One said, do you look at every dog show for every day in the country to figure out where you're going? I said, as a matter of fact, I do. <laughs> I look at the whole calendar and I look at every pan. Similar dogs. And then from there, you need to take them, those dogs that you think represents that style. And if they don't necessarily continually reward them, you know, maybe tweak it. And there are judges who I've taken a barrage of type and styles to over a multitude of times, and I can never get past them. And that's fine. I just don't necessarily want to ever exhibit under them again. And there's other judges who are consistent as all get out. And you'll say, well, they're judging in North Carolina today. And you look at their results, and they put up litter mate to what you showed to them the week before that went winner's pitch. You know, and so I think finding that kind of balance of knowing what those judges are going to put up if you can bring them to them every time they're going to love it and they'll know that you're you're coming and so i just want to put a brief example in there real quick we have somebody that we work pretty closely with who started getting into dogs and back into dogs in 2000 and i'm going to say 16. Uh, she bred goldens in the early 80s as pets and really wanted to start breeding again so she bought two bitches we finished both of those bitches and she is the best at saying whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do, whatever you think. So between those two bitches, I said, we're going to, we finished them both. And after the second one finished, I said, you're going to place her. So she placed her. Hmm. The other bitch she bred to a stud dog and to retain type, created a grand champion. Then I had her breed the bitch again to a different stud dog, picked what dog, and that became a grand champion. Mm -hmm. Then I gave her a bitch and said, here, and let's run everything by me. And that bitch produced what became a best in show, best in specialty show winner. Mm -hmm. And now she's produced some puppies that I think are even better that are in my backyard. Mm -hmm. Now, what does this gal have as a, as a, a benefit? She has, because she started with two, then placed one, then had one that was bred twice and got another, she's got three different styles. So now what I tell her is 
we're going to breed each one of those bitches type to type. And you're going to retain three styles. So if you're keeping one of each, that's six dogs, you have a dog you can show any given weekend to any given judge. Mm -hmm. So I think if you don't really know what your preference is as far as your building blocks, I don't know what my ideal is. Well, get two and figure out which judges are better for which ones and then try to retain those types. Right. I understand everybody can't have a hundred dogs. Right. But not, not all of us can have the access to the ability right. to keep half a dozen dogs. Right. But, but I, I think, think two is reasonable, but that's just me. Right. <laughs> but I think too, what you're saying, Christian, more most importantly is the research piece. Right. And again, that is based on being very honest and very knowledgeable about what your dog actually is and is right doing. that's the right. first step number one and then having spent enough time watching live streams or watching photos on social media or what have you that you can look at those judges all around right. the country and what they've put up and see in your mind's eye the dogs and the style right. and the consistency and or inconsistency right Right. I mean, it goes both ways. And and, and um, to say it politely, I mean, for me, there's probably 20 people that I really seek out to show what I think are the best of what I have. The rest of them are just there and just kind of doing their thing. Right. And so I don't want people to get burnt out on the fact that maybe they're not winning. Maybe they shouldn't. Right. And that's fine. But maybe their mentor says, this is a great one. And what's holding you back is your ability and the judges you're exhibiting to. And once you figure that out and you find the right judges who appreciate that style, you've got the golden ticket, yeah. right? So it's a fine line between understanding that not everybody who's pointing the finger are experts. You need to become an expert yourself first and do this for yourself. And then from there, that's when the success comes. You know, I do actually kind of feel bad for people who the greatest one they ever had was the first one, right? Because they will never, if they had that great one 15 years down the line, it could have done 10 times of what it did the first time, it's right? True. So I, enjoy. I, I think back even to some of the right. earlier dogs I had and wish that I right. could have had them. You had them later, mm -hmm. right? And just from the knowledge you retained as for what judges to show them to, the knowledge you retained for how to present them and the knowledge you retain for what judges to take them to. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that people don't need to be on the, the, the they want the Polar Express ticket to dreamland. Right. And ex instead just take the train, enjoy the view and the destination will be worth it once you get there. Right? Well, And if you, if you take the train, you get to enjoy more of the actual journey and you right. get to enjoy some of the uh, scenery along the way, just as right. we, Take our analogies a little sideways there. <laughs> right. So, and I, I, I'm trying to cover a lot of things, mm -hmm. but I want to kind of roll back and reverse um, to kind of what brought my attention on just the whole thing about having an open discussion. I think you can get into the finite details of how to become successful in this sport. Um, and, and everybody has, you know, their own opinions and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But when you come up from the bottom and you work for a professional handler, and I understand that some people's age kind of inhibits that thing. And so they don't know, you know, they don't see that aspect of it. But there's things that are taught in 4-H when you're working as an assistant that um, I guess a lot of professionals think is common knowledge. And it kind of hit me two weeks ago that these people maybe have never had these things presented to them. Right. So I just want to cover a couple things real quick. Okay. Gently now, Christian, gently. Gently. Oh, I'm always gentle. Look at me. You know, <laughs> so anyway, yeah. first one is you never leave a dog on a table unattended. Seems like a very simple thing to a lot of us, but some people were never taught that. And I walked past the setup that was an owner handler and the woman had gone to the RV, two RVs over and the dog was there, but you don't know what could happen. The second thing is don't leave dogs in X pens unattended you're asking for a disaster to happen. And I see this from owner handlers to breeders to professional handlers. There's nobody there, right? Sometimes you got to go into the van to grab something. Sometimes you got to run into the trailer and grab something. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about 20, 30 minutes where there's nothing, right? The other thing is 
And this is a big one for me. And I kind of I thought it was standard and more and more and more. I'm seeing it less and less and less. Congratulate the winners. I have probably walked into, I couldn't tell you, thousands of rings from juniors as an owner handler, as a breeder owner handler, as a professional handler. I could maybe count on one hand the amount of times I didn't say congratulations. And the reason I did would be because I had knowledge that most people would have never had about the situation and how it fell on that certain day. And I thought, this is, you know, crazy. This is totally crazy. But those five times were once I've walked into 2,000 rings. I, I don't even know, right? Right. Say congratulations to the winner. If the judge makes a cut and you leave, that's fine. If you're in a full group, whether it's the owner handler group, their regular group, you don't have to go four, three, two, one and shake everybody's hand, although that's nice and you'll get, you know, kudos. All you got to do is walk up to the winner and say congratulations. If you're in a class of three in the first one, one, it doesn't kill you to say, hey, congrats. Yep. If you're in winner's pitch, the judge awards winner's pitch, congratulations. Yep. Right. And, and in some breeds, I think you see it more. In some areas, you see it more. But the amount of breeds I watch and the judge goes, best of breed, best of winners, opposite, select, select. And you could hear a pin drop, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes there is personal beasts that people don't want to get past. But what does a congrats hurt you? But that's my point. And I, I speak on this all the time on the podcast. You say congratulations right. to your worst enemy on right. purpose. Right. Because it makes their head spin off their body if no other reason. Right. right. And, and again, the reason... Nobody should have a reason not to, uh, not to say something, especially as a young owner handler or owner handler of any age. And they think, well, I didn't win just because it's an, I'm not a handler. And this is, you know, even when they call the owner handlers back into the ring and they award one, you know, and here's another thing I want to touch on real quick. I want to take a sidebar. I know you're looking at the clock going. I did. I just Louise. out of the corner of my eye. I'm like, how Hurry are you doing, up. Christian? <laughs> So I don't worry, I'm on to you. So anyway, um, I just want to take a sidebar and say, I have this motto, which is the people who are most against division are the ones who end up creating it. Right. And that goes with anything in life. But you're seeing it more and more and more in the sport of dogs, whether it's judges who are favorable to professional handlers or favorable to owner handlers, because it goes both ways. Whether it's people who are angry about the ribbon size from one group to the other group, whether whatever it may be, right? We're all there for a common purpose, and that's to win and to have fun with our dogs, right? I wish that people would stop saying more things like handlers do this and that and owner handlers do. We're all there for the same reason. And the best owner handlers are competitive in the regular group. Mm -hmm. And the regular handlers don't need to be in the owner handler group. You know, and that's fine. But what, what kind of gets me is this division that's being created and that, you know, owner handlers set up together and the handlers set up together. And if any of those owner handlers went and asked the professional handlers for any kind of advice, they're going to give it. And on the contrary, when you've got a really nice dog and your owner handled and 10 handlers tell you how great it is, it's because they want your dog. So you've got a really good one. I mean, I mean, not all. Yes. I'm but... saying a large amount, right? I've seen it happen. I, I'm not going to say it doesn't happen, but I think that you can take that compliment. A hundred percent. handler, Take that compliment and then say, hey, could you give me a hand with such and such? Right. You don't, you don't have to hire that handler if you don't want to. A hundred percent. No, that's can. not what I'm saying. What I was going to say is that means they want your dog and you've got a really good one. Mm -hmm. So do it, put in the extra effort and push a little bit harder and make your goal, the regular group. Mm -hmm. Just last weekend when I was in Montana, the same dog won owner handler, best in show, bred by best in show and yeah. best in show. The I week saw. before that, another dog, one handler, owner handler. She went reserve, best in show, owner handler, best in show, regular, right? It's possible, but you yeah, have possible. to put yourself in the mindset is I'm here to do the best I can with my dog and present it to the best I can and not go, well, how do I get a group three so I can get whether it's regular or owner handler points, right? right? Take a points and the stats out of it and don't make That's every decision right. based on that. <laughs> you know, yes. make if your we decision. Can take the stats out of dog shows. I think right. I, I, my number one thing, 
my most favorite thing in the world. If I could do one thing, I would take the stats out. I don't, yeah. I don't have to do all the other crazy fancy stuff that everybody talks about. Just eliminate statistics, eliminate right. rankings, done. Right. And then, and, and the problems. Right. And when you look at your top five dogs in your breed or your top five dogs in your group, you know, when you get into your top 10 dogs of all breeds, typically they're a pretty good dog. But the thing is, is a lot of times they just have the financial ability to get to more shows. That doesn't mean they're the greatest one of their individual breed. Right. right? And maybe they are. I'm not saying they're not. But all I'm saying is that goes back to when I said, take your time to go to your large specialties and your national specialties or go watch the breed at Westminster or Orlando and realize, gosh, there's a dog that could actually beat this one. And, and you won't figure that out right away. But in five years when you're watching and you're very invested in your breed, don't just assume that the one that's winning is the best one. Go watch the breed. And sometimes you watch the breed and go, wow, that dog is way better than I ever thought it was. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you go, well, there was two dogs over there that if they were just presented a little bit better, you know, or didn't have the clout or the financial backing behind them, yeah. they could beat that dog every day of the week, you know. Well, and I think, you know, there's <laughs> there's an awful lot of nuance out there. But the bottom line is go show your dog. Do the best right. you can. Ask questions at the top of the hill, not at the bottom of the hill. Correct. At what rolls down to the bottom. Right. Right. Okay. Ask <laughs> from people who know. Um, you know, I saw a thing on social media just the other day, just completely on point to this. Well, what does it take to, you know, get a best in show? And everybody's like, well, lots of money and a big time right. professional handler. And I'm like, no. Right. Right. <laughs> what it takes to get a best in show is a really good dog. A really good, good dog. The, and a little the, bit of timing. And blah, blah, blah. Right. But, right. Yeah. Right place at Right, right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's three judges or sometimes two judges that go from the bottom to the top. Yep. And it's just all about timing. And there's been times we've shown up and thought, this is the greatest panel I've ever seen for this particular dog. Right. And you walk in the building and you look over and there's one who's even better under those judges. And that's fine, right? That's fair. No, it's, no, it's not. It makes you cry sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you lock I can, eyes. I can promise you. And they you. realize why yep. you're here and you realize yep. why they're yep. there. Yep. You don't know whether to smile, cry, or hug them, right? No, just and cry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never you know, forget. A never, perfect, perfect example. Spamante, you remember the, the, the Spinoni? Yep. Yep. I drove all the way down to somewhere in Arizona godforsaken thing at the end of the year because it was a great setup for the dog thinking i'm gonna be able to pull out something cool here and in i stroll and in strolls phil booth with oakley <laughs> who was the number one dog of all breeds at the time and i'm like god hates uh, me god definitely yep. hates me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know and that's the thing life happens it's, but but in the moment you're self-reflective to go well, it's maybe better judges for that dog. Maybe that, you know, whatever the point may be and not going, oh, I'm going to lose just because, you know. Yeah. And and I think the, the here's the, my takeaway for the for the thing. You know, find, talk to the best and ask opinions of many, but don't overstay your welcome where you don't use any of those opinions. Use right? the information you get. That's, that is, right. as a mentor, someone is constantly in your ear, constantly in your ear. And you turn around and they haven't done one damn thing you've said right. and they're still bitching. And I'm like, all right, right. wait a minute. <laughs> right. And it's a difficult thing to cut ties with a mentor if you feel that they're not taking you to the place that you want to be. But ultimately, they should be more happy for your success than they are for their individual su success because they've helped you become who you are. And if you hit that roadblock while you're five, ten years in, and you go, God, I haven't done what I've wanted to do. My mentor is handing me all these dogs and they're blaming it on the horrible judging and saying their dogs are perfect. You know, maybe it's time to go, I'm going to buy a puppy from this person. Could you help me pick one? And if they go irate, well, that's a little problematic. If they say, oh, that's a great idea. Maybe we could co-own it. You know, then you're on to something. And so there's a lot more people who, you know, have day jobs. They can't focus their 100% of their time on the sport then there are people who just sit and only focus on this. So find the people who are at the top and talk to them. And you don't even have to talk to them about what they did to go best and show them. How's the weather today? You know, what, what are you having for lunch? You know, we're all just people. 
Yeah. And, and yeah. some handlers are kind of, you know, or judges think that because they point the finger or because they show nice dogs, they have the opportunity to, you know, maybe be a little belitt belittling to people. We're all just people running in circles. And I think you'll find most of the time people are willing to help. So be self-reflective of your own dogs. Make sure you say congratulations to your winners. Yes. Basic animal husbandry skills. Yes. Make sure you yes. go watch Dog Steps to understand basic anatomy and motion. Read your standards. And read your standards, right? And I think the hardest part about reading your standards is that it's difficult for people to <clears throat> co co um, compartmentalize right. what the words are saying if they don't understand to how they're being applied. You know, I had this conversation with Pat Trotter one time and she says, you know, the standards when they were written, cause she had, she had say in a lot of standards cause she was a school teacher. So she helped kind of mend some of them. Yeah. She said, when we were doing this, we didn't assume that people wouldn't want, you know, think that the dog should be, you know, whatever the case may be, there's things now that let's say sound in motion with minimal wasted action. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and my breed is solid back and many sporting breeds, a solid mm -hmm. back as, mm -hmm. and dog steps. One of the lines is, you know, uh, for goldens, a rugged constitution and a super front are essential for carrying large game or Canadian goose and a solid back reduces working, a rolling back reduces working efficiency and is tiring. Right. So anyway, my point is, I don't know where I was going, but I was going somewhere. It's fine. <laughs> oh, read your standard. You got to know how to apply standard. You got to know how to apply it. You gotta but we're going to, I, I'm, I, we're over time, but I want to tie this. I know. I'm sorry. All, no, it's okay. Don't worry about it, dude. Them. We're good. I want to tie it one more. I want to do full circle. So in order to, you can't just read your standard and magically understand it. Right. That's where you need a really trusted mentor. Right. And maybe it's not someone in your breed. Maybe it is. Right. Um, well, that's a great point out. too. That's Seek a great point. Out people who will help you. So when the standard says that, you know, the occiput is prominent or the occiput isn't prominent, what does that mean? Talk to me, show me what that right. means on the dog. I'm talking, let's go to like bare basic for right. dog getting started people. And, and sadly, maybe some people that are further along, but anyway, <laughs> uh, um, have someone really actually show you right. what the standard means on an animal. And right. I think that is so helpful. I think you just hit on something too. I just want to catch on real quick. Is that mm -hmm. you said have a mentor, whether it's in your breed or another. Mm -hmm. And I think that maybe you don't need to inquire breed specific information yeah. about your yeah. dog, but yeah. talking to people who are in other breeds or very successful at other breeds, mm -hmm. the conversation is all very similar and they can help you, right? Yeah. Maybe they don't know the foundational aspects of your dog or what it takes to make the next level, you know, clumber as I'm looking right. over your shoulder, but they can give you advice on how to be successful in the sport. And that advice will help get you to people who can make the, you know, a great clumber or Doberman so or whatever. I can, I can for, let's just, we're going to do a quick, for example, I have a, um, what, like a, like a, a clumber spaniel. And I'm going to go to Christian who does not have, right. a clumber spaniel, right. but understands dogs, or right. I'm going to go to Bill McFadden. Or I'm right. going to go to uh, any one of an um, enormous number of people in the sport who have been very successful over the course of time, understand right. what dogs mean. And I'm going to show them my clumber spaniel and I'm going to show them the breed standard and say, I don't get it. Right. <laughs> right. And have someone that will take an hour and walk through that with you. Right. Well, and the thing, too, is uh, even gathering information on other people, like you said, Bill McFadden. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have a, a horse in the game when it comes to Wire Fox. And honestly, it's not even a breed I seek out to watch at some of these major shows. But I've seen some of his really nice pictures and said, well, how are you planning to breed them? Just because I'm curious. Same right. with like Australian shepherd breeders or what? How are you planning to breed them? Yeah. And I just want to say one last thing and then we'll go. If you go to any great breeder's place, any of them, they're going to have two, three of their best winners. And then they're going to have some bitches who they say, oh, I could maybe finish or it's not worth my time to finish. And then you go, well, why are they keeping them? Well, the pedigree, you know, oh, its father was the greatest one I ever had. And it's my last one. Or its mother's mother was the best producer. And she, this was a singleton from her mother. There's always a reason. 
And so, like I said in the very beginning, it's just as easy to breed a best in show gener winner in three generations from a great dog as it is a subpar dog if you're extra critical. But when you talk to those great breeders, they're going to have some dogs who've never walked into the ring, and that has the opportunity to produce the best in show winner, right? And so when you have a mentor like that, and you can talk to them and say, well, why are you keeping this one? You know, it didn't win. You showed it 15 times. It never won. Why in the world would you keep it? It's a building block, and every piece is a building block. So don't discard the dog you have unless it has a bad temperament for the breed. It has a disqualifying fault. It has one of your major health it concerns it didn't clear, don't keep it, right? Don't perpetuate it forward. But if it checks all the boxes and it's healthy and its pedigree is okay, build off of that, right? Everybody's building off of something else, but you have to be critical about what pieces you're building forward onto. So that's that. Okay. Well, there you go. All right, okay. you guys, the world according to Christian. <laughs> it's a scary place. Well, you know, it's an adventure. It's like a, it's like a jungle gym. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Everything's always bouncing. <laughs> All right, Christian. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time.